John chapter number 13, I want to draw your attention to verse number 34. The Bible says, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. Verse number 35 as well. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples if ye have love one to another. Now notice here he makes the statement, the statement, a new commandment I'm giving unto you. And then he tells you what this new commandment is at this moment. He says the new commandment is that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. Now number one, the first thing I want to point out that is, that is a fallacy on the world's part is that they will turn to this passage and they will try to use this passage to teach that you need to love everyone. Now here's the thing, the Bible does teach that number one, you should love your brethren and that you should love the world as in the majority of just unsaved people. But there is a, a minute amount of people, a, a, you know, a small group of people that the Bible says are haters of God. We shouldn't love those people. So let me start with that just in the beginning. But 99.9% .9 of the people in the world we should love, but that's not what this is teaching. This is actually talking about the, the, the apostles, the disciples who were there at that moment, that they should have love for each other. And the language there of one another, I believe, is what causes a lot of confusion for people. But when it says one another, all it's saying is each other. Look one more time. It says, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another. Speaking about the group that is there at that moment. He says, as I have loved you, speaking to his disciples, speaking to his apostles, as, as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. Speaking again to his disciples. So this commandment is specifically given, and before Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, he makes sure at such a pivotal moment that he gives them this new commandment. And this is obviously an important commandment. This is at this time, before he goes to the cross, this is some of the last messages that he's able to relay unto them. And he says so when he gives it to them, that this is a new commandment. I mean, that right there kind of draws your attention immediately. A new commandment I give unto you. He said this new commandment is that you love one another. So we have to make sure we know who this is directed towards. It's, it's a specific commandment about loving each other as in Christians. Loving the one disciple, loving the other disciples, right? Look at the very next verse, verse number 35, also very important truth from this. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples. Now that statement actually following verse 34 proves that verse 34 is not telling you to love everyone. You know why? Because he's saying by this shall all men know the world. They're going to know that you're my disciples. Why? Because you guys love each other. Notice how that also debunks that. That idea, that, that uh, false teaching that this is telling you. I've seen many people hold up signs like this, you know, particularly like homosexuals. I've seen tons of signs, love one another. And they think that just applies to everyone. That's not what the, Jesus was talking to his disciples at this moment. Right. This is a commandment given to Christians right. is what this is. And he's saying to love each other. Now notice what he said to you, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples. It's important to... Preach against sin. It's important to stand up against the sins of the world. It's important to preach against adultery. It's important to preach against fornication. It's important to preach against the sins of the world. But you know what? Valley Baptist Church should not be known about that. that. You know, when Jacksonville, the city of Jacksonville, hears the name Valley Baptist Church in 20 years, they shouldn't automatically think, man, those people stand hard against the homosexuals. Man, those people, they take a hard stance against, you know, the sins of the... See, we should do that, shouldn't we? Should, I'm not saying we shouldn't stand against the homosexuals. I'm not saying that we shouldn't stand against the sins of the world. We shouldn't stand against fornication and all these things. But that's not what the world should know us by. That's not what the world, when they think of value about this church, the first thing that comes to their mind is, isn't that the guy that was on the television you know, that was, that was preaching against the homosexuals, that was saying, you know, fag and queer and all this stuff. Yeah. That's not what we should be known by. See, here's the thing. And someone could say, well, that's, the, people are known by that because they, they're, they're so radical in that sense. Well, the opposite is true as well in this case. We should love each other so much and be willing to do, do that much for all of other Christians and all other disciples that that's what draws people's attention. When they see one another loving each other, when they see what you are willing to do for one another, 
That should stand out to other people. That's what Jesus is teaching here. That what the world should walk away with of new information about your church, about the Christians, about the disciples here, when they walk away from you, they should say, man, those people really love each other. They really care for each other. Those disciples, those Christians, they really love one another. I want you to turn over to John chapter number 15. And this actually makes much more sense when you look at the, the other time where Jesus made this statement. John chapter number 15, verse number 12. He says it again. He says this. This is my commandment that ye love one another. So notice that he says that this is the commandment again, right? But look at the next part that he adds on. This is my commandment that ye love one another as I have loved you. As I have loved you. Look at verse number 13. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Now you're wondering, how are we going to love each other so much to the point where people are going to be, you know, people are going to just know Valley Baptist Church by the care that all the Christians have for themselves? Well, if you care for everyone in this building as much as Jesus Christ cared for you, as much as Jesus Christ cared for his disciples, if you go so far as to say that you would be willing to die for other Christians... Because that's what this is teaching. I don't know if you've actually taken this to its full extent, but that's what Jesus is saying. Do you know why all the world would talk about, man, those people really care for each other. Man, those people really love each other. Man, they're, they're a really close-knit group. If one person in the group was literally willing to die for someone else in the group. That's a great love, isn't it? That would be something that's spoken of by everyone in the city. That would be something that's spoken of by everyone possibly... In the nation, if there was some sort of, you never know what, what type of, because we see the, the, the situations and the circumstances that the apostles were surrounded with and encountered, where they literally, in some cases, had to denounce Christ or die. Or they had to, you know, because they're all, you know, the same types of situations that we see today, where, you know, the government will come in and what will they do? They'll, they'll try to force you to give up information about someone else, won't they? We never know what's going to be going on in the tribulation, and that's what Jesus was preparing them for in, in a lot of these, these, uh, this last talk that he, was, that he was talking to them about here. And what we need to do is we need to bring ourselves to the point as Christians where we have the same love for one another that Christ had for us. You say, that's not attainable. Well, I don't think he would have told us that if it's not attainable. I want you to turn to 1 John chapter number 3, verse number 11. I'm going to read from here from John chapter number 15, verse number 17. The Bible says this. These things I command you, that ye love one another. So notice repeatedly, and he keeps bringing this up. Go to 1 John chapter number 3, verse number 11. 1 John chapter number 3. I preach tonight about loving your church family. The importance of loving one another. The importance of loving one another. Look at 1 John chapter number 3, verse number 11. 1 John chapter number 3, verse number 11. The Bible says this again. For this is the message that ye heard from the beginning. And then he says that we should love one another. Go to 1 John chapter number 3, verse number 23. Look down there in that same chapter. 1 John chapter number 3, verse number 23. It says this. And this is his commandment that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. Flip over 1 John chapter number 4, verse number 7. 1 John chapter number 4, verse number 7. We'll see this repeated again. 1 John chapter number 4, verse 7. It says this. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. Skip down 1 John chapter number 4, verse number 10. It says this. Herein is love. So now he's going to explain to you. He just told you to love one another. Now he's going to explain to you what love is. I want you to notice the consistency of what we saw in John chapter 15. Herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Now, when we read over in John chapter number 15, when he said, love one another as I loved you, he explained to you what particular thing that he had done for us that he, where, in where he expressed his love, where he expressed his love. And what was it? Be willing to die. Sacrificing, right? Well, here now we see where the Bible talks about here in his love. And it is great love. How the father was willing to give up the son also, right? He was willing to sacrifice his son for us. That is also an expression of love that should teach you how to love your brethren. He told them there in verse number 
uh, 7, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. Right? Then once we get down to verse number 10, here's the definition of love. That's what he's saying. Herein is love. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Love, the greatest love that you could express for someone else, would be a sacrificial love. That's what that would be. We should be to the point with other brothers and sisters in Christ, with people that are in our church, where we have a sacrificial love. We should love one another so much to where you would be willing to die for others. This is biblical. This is what the Bible teaches. And you know what? A lot of Christians today are so disconnected from the church members that attend their church. They go in, they're there for an hour. They have a better relationship with people at work than they do other fellow Christians. And that's sad. That's ridiculous. You should, not only are they not willing to die for the other Christians at their church, they're not even truly friends with the people at their church. We should have such a great friendship with the people at our church that we should be willing to lose our life for them. I want to keep repeating this because I want you to understand how serious this is. And it may sound drastic, but you, maybe because you just never heard it preached, but that's what the Bible teaches. You know, it may sound extreme, but you know what? That's what Jesus said. Jesus' words are extreme to you then. But Jesus said that you should love one another as, as he loved his disciples. That they should love one another the same way. And then he explained, greater love hath no man than this. And he says that a man lay down his life for his friends. You know the reason why he used friends there? He's relating himself as being a friend to them. And he's saying the same way that I love you, you need to love the rest of them. That's what he's saying. The same way, Peter, that I love you and I'm willing to die for you, Peter, you should love John and be willing to die for John. That's what he's saying to them. Greater love has no man than this. Do you want to be able to express the greatest love? Then you need to follow my example. That's what he's telling them. So in the same way that he loved his disciples and was willing to the point of sacrificial love, that's the way that we should love one another. Look at verse number 11. Watch what it says again. Beloved, if God so loved us, so if he loved us in this way, we ought also to love one another. In what way? Sacrificial love. That's what he keeps bringing up. <clears throat> Look at verse 12. No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us and his love is perfected in us. I want you to look at again at verse number. Let's look at verse 10. I want you to notice what happens here with the overlapping of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit here. Look at verse 10. Herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Now, God there and sent his Son, we would say, is the Father, right? Well, look at verse number 11. Beloved, if God so loved us, we haven't changed subject. There's only one God in the first place, but I want to demonstrate something to you. It's the Father. Beloved, if God so loved us, we, we ought also to love one another. Watch this. No man has seen God at any time. Father, right? Look at what it says next. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us. Who dwells in you? That's the Father. God dwelleth in us. Look at this. And his love is perfected in us. Look at verse 13. Hereby know we that we dwell in him and him and he in us because he hath given us of his spirit. Amen. You know, the God there is the spirit that's dwelling in you. That's the Father. Because the Father is the spirit. God is the spirit. You can compare this to John chapter number 4. I don't know if you ever noticed that before, but I want to point it out. I like to kick that dog any opportunity I get. Go to Romans chapter number 12, verse number 10. Romans chapter number 12, verse number 10. <clears throat> Romans chapter number 12, verse number 10. <clears throat> Look what the Bible says in Romans 12, 10. The Bible says, that is, oh, I'm in 11, 10, 12, 10, yes. Romans chapter number 12, verse number 10, the Bible says this. Be kindly affectioned one to another. Notice what it says. With brotherly love and honor preferring one another. So notice he tells you to love one another. That's what he's saying when he says be kindly affectioned one to another. And then he says with brotherly love. You know what he's telling you is that you need to love one another like you would love your family. That's what he's saying. With brotherly love, saying as if you were brothers and sisters. Now we are not obviously biological brothers and sisters. Maybe some from North Carolina are, but, I, but we're, we're not biologically brothers and sisters, right? But the Bible says that we are brothers and sisters in Christ. The Bible says the moment that you believe in Jesus, you're put into that family, the family of God. God is our Father. All, everyone in here, we all share a Father. Think about that. We all share a Father. 
the Lord Jesus Christ. God is at all of our Father, right? All of us. That puts us in the same family. That means everyone in here are brothers and sisters in Christ. And you should have a, you should have a stronger bond with, I firmly believe this, you should have a stronger bond with those that share a heavenly Father than those that share a physical Father. Amen. Now, and you know, it's a blessing if you have, like with the Bob's brothers and Bob's sisters, if you have a brother and sister that serves God on the same level that you do. I mean, what a blessing. Amen. But you know what? That shouldn't be what really brings you together. You know, what, sh what really brings people together should be the bond of, ha of sharing that heavenly father, of having that same father, being a part of the same Christian family. Amen. You know, serving that we all serve and we all love the same God, the same creator, the same savior. Right? That should really be. And you know what? Uh, you know, in, the, in the book of Ruth, there's a great example of this. And I didn't mention this when I preached through that book. But you see Ruth, who is willing to, to forsake her family and to go with Naomi. You see her willing to just leave all of, all of everything she had growing up behind. Why? Because she obviously had a close bond with Naomi, but it was also because your God will be my God, she says. So what was most important to her in that case? She wasn't going to stay and serve the gods you know, that the Moabites served. That was not what was important to her. She wanted to go with Naomi. She wanted to go and she wanted to serve the Lord. Now, so that kind of shows you the importance of priority. Like I said, it's a great situation when you have biological brothers and sisters that are able to serve with you. But the most important thing, the priority should be the Lord. The priority should be our Christian families. Well, let's look at another verse here. Look at Ephesians chapter number 4. I'll give you something practical here. Uh, Ephesians chapter number 4. And I think we have one more verse that we'll look at after that. Ephesians chapter number 4. Uh, look at verse number 1. We'll read verses 1 through 3. Ephesians chapter number 4 verse 1 says, I therefore, the I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. Then he says this, with all lowliness and meekness. So he's speaking of being humble, right? Humility. With long suffering. Watch what he says next. Forbearing one another in love. Endeavoring. So by doing that, by being long suffering and forbearing one another in love, you would be endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. So this is a very practical truth that we can learn from this particular chapter right here. And that is, in order to keep unity, in order to keep a sense of oneness as a church, you know what you're going to have to do? You're going to have to put up with things. That's what this is teaching. You're going to have to put up with stuff. That's what it means to be long-suffering. That's what it means when the Bible says right there, forbearing. That means to put up with something. And I know I mentioned this one other time, but if you think about this, what we have to put up with here is nothing like what Jesus Christ had to put up in his soul and in his spirit, if you will, in his spirit with the disciples. The Lord Jesus Christ is just that. He is the Lord of all. He's perfect. He is sinless. He is, he is righteous. He, he has no sin. He, you know, the, the, the all-knowing God is walking around with a bunch of fishermen and tax collectors who are known by the common man as being ignorant and unlearned. And then you have the all-wise God walking around. These, these are his friends. I mean, seriously, and I'm not trying to diss Peter and James and John, but think of the stupidity he had to put up with. Think of not only, not only the ignorance, but think of you know, just the imperfections that he had to put up with See, I'm a sinner, so being around other sinners is not that, there's not a difference, right? There's, I, can, I understand, I can relate to you, right? But Jesus Christ is perfect, and he's going around with, you know, the 12 disciples. One of them's the devil, but he's going around with the, oh, let's just cut that guy out of the equation. Eleven of them, who are men that are following him, that Jesus is seeing their faults all day long. Jesus is seeing their imperfections. Jesus is seeing their sins daily. Jesus knows these men's personal struggles in their life. You know what he did? He put up with it. I'm sure he helped them and tried to, you know, give them advice and things. I'm sure that he did those things. But you know what he had to do a lot? He had to put up with it. He did. He had to just forbear. You know what he had to be? Long-suffering to keep the unity. And everybody here, do you know what we have to do to keep the bond, to keep the unity? 
you got to put up with each other. Yeah. Really? Because yeah. everybody here is a sinner. That's why. You say, why would we have to put up? Because everybody's going to make mistakes. Right. There are people in here that are going to do you wrong. There are people in here that are going to say things to you that are going to offend you. There are people in here that are going to you know, do things in here. Do, that are going to, people in this room are going to do things to you that are going to offend you. They're going to say things to you. They're going to offend you at some point or another. You know what you need to do? You need to put up with it. Amen. You need to just forbear. Right? You need to just be long-suffering. You know what it means to be long-suffering? It means to be very patient. Not just to be patient, to be very patient. That's what it means to be long-suffering. Why would you do that? Because you love those people. That's why. Why do you think Jesus did it with the disciples? Because he loved them. And that goes also for the example. Think about this. Even after spending such close time with them, even after sleeping you know, in the same room with them, even after spending all this time with the disciples, he was still willing to die for those men on the cross. Even after seeing all their imperfections, all their problems, you know, seeing Peter fail multiple times, he still went to the cross and died for Peter. He still loved those people. He still loved those disciples. Think about his perspective and how, what just, just the, the drastic difference between him and them. And then compare that to the minimal difference of every person sitting in this room today. You know, there's different maturity levels of spiritual. There always will be, right? But you know what? It doesn't matter. You still need to put up with it. You still need to, and what's going to cause you to do that? Love. Loving each other. That's what's going to allow you and help you to be able to be long-suffering with other people because you love them. You need to grow in Christ's example. Everything that Christ did for us, did on this earth, is an example for us to do. We, we will not be able to attain under the perfect love. We will not be able to attain under the, perf the measure of the stature of a perfect man, which is Christ. But we need to strive to. We need to strive to keep the unity in our church. You know how you do it? By love. And we need to be a church that's known like, man, they really love each other. If that sounds weird to you, then Jesus' words sound weird to you. I'm not just trying to be manly. That's not what I'm trying to do. That's not my number one goal. You know, I'm trying to follow the Bible. That's what I'm trying to do. And you know what we should do here? We should be a church that, don't nobody walk up and hug me after the service. <laughs> we should be a, a church that loves, I'm partially serious. We should be a church that loves one another, right? Amen. We should be a, hey, I'll, I'm not going to hug you, but I'll die for you, all right? We should be a church that loves one another. We should be a church that loves one another so much that if it were really to come down to it, seriously, in your lifetime, where you would be willing to put your head on a chopping block for somebody else in this room. Right. I mean, think about that. That's what Jesus said. If you think that's too much, then you think Jesus is asking for too much. That's the love that one Christian should have for another Christian. That, that one person, especially in a local church, should have for another person in a local church. That's what they were. They were just the local church. Jesus as the chief shepherd. They went around in a local church. He said, you should love one another the same way that I love you. And what did he do? Greater love hath no man than this, that a man laid out his life for his friends. I want you to turn to uh, 2 John. We'll look at one more example of this. In 2 John... And that's going to be verse number 5. I'll read to you from 1 Peter chapter number 3, verse number 8. 1 Peter chapter number 3, verse number 8 reads, Finally, be ye all of one mind. So notice, he's telling them to keep unity, right? Again, just as we read in Ephesians 4. And then he says this, Having compassion one of another. Now I want you to read over that. What does the word compassion mean? What does is, what is the word compassion mean? The definition of compassion it means you're showing grace to someone when they're in, an, in a stage of infirmity. That's what compassion is. So notice, again, you know, the compassion you know, being spoken of is talking about one person you know, putting up with, if you will, being long-suffering to another person. You would have compassion on someone else that has done wrong. God has compassion on us because he died for us, right? It's showing mercy or grace to someone, it's, it, but it's, it's specifically speaking of the act of doing something for that person by having compassion. So what's the implication? That someone might have done something wrong. That's what that's saying. Having compassion one of another. And then watch this again. Love as brethren. Now, are we physical brothers and sisters? We're not. But he keeps saying love as brethren. Brotherly love. You should love each other like a family loves one another. Love as brethren. And then he says be pitiful 
be courteous. We're going to look at this one more time here in 2 John. Look at verse number 5. 2 John, verse number 5. And now I beseech thee, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that which we had from the beginning. And then he tells her again that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk after his commandments. So that's how we would show our love to God, would be keeping his commandments. But notice the, the exact wording of the same command just being repeated. Just, it's just almost to the point of redundancy. Just the repetition of this commandment. What does that tell you? It's important. It's significant. He keeps bringing this up. It's in 2 John. It's in 1 John. We can look at all of Paul's writings almost where he talks about brotherly love, loving one another. I mean, you have Philippians 2. I mean, it's all over. And I didn't look everywhere for it. You know, uh, but the, my point is this. There's, there's a, a, a high level of importance or significance that's put on the local church having love one for another. And you say, yeah, we should love one another, right? But you know what? We need a practical example of that. We need to know what love is. We need a definition of what love is. Because love means something different to other people, doesn't it? You know what? This is what's not preached very often. And that is that you should love one another to the point where you are willing to die for each other. I want you to think about that. <coughs> You know, think about that throughout this week and try to grow in love towards one another. You know what? When you start putting, putting effort forth, like, hey, I want to love my brothers and sisters at church more, you know what you'll start noticing is? You'll start noticing that they're, they're probably a little bit harder to love than you thought. Really. You'll start noticing more faults. When you start putting forth the love, it doesn't matter what church you're in. It doesn't matter how spiritually mature the person that you're trying to love is, when you start putting the effort forth, then you're going to be more attentive to that person. You know what you're going to notice? They have more problems than I thought they had. And you know what you need to do? You need to be long-suffering with that person. And you need to continue to grow in love with that person. You know, we need to continue to grow in love for all of our church members. Amen. And we shouldn't be known for the, you know, the, that Valley Baptist Church is a hate group. If they want to label us as a hate group for preaching against sodomites, that's not going to stop me from preaching against homos, number Amen. one. But here's the thing. That's not what I want this church to be known for. That's not what I want to say. That's who Valley Baptist Church is. That's not what I want the world to be saying about our church. I want the world to be saying, man, you know, they're, you know, they're a bunch of weirdos, but they really love each other. I really, I wish that I had friends that, you know, that, that loved me like that. That's the kind of love that every Christian in here should have for the other people that are in this building. That's the way that you should feel about all the other brothers and sisters in Christ. You should love them just like how Christ loved his friends. Isn't it great to be able to, be able to you know, that, that he, let's say this, that he put himself on that level? Because he was humble enough to do that, to where he would be the example to love all of his friends. And he calls them friends. And he says, you know what? Now you love all of your friends the same way. And that's what we need to do. It's always Christ being our perfect example. We always need to look unto Christ, and we need to try to attain unto that perfect man. And we should have a great love, a love that pushes us to where we, even if it came down to it at some point, where we would be willing to die for our other brothers and sisters in Christ. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father God, we thank you, dear Lord, for being the example, dear Lord, that no one else could be. We thank you, dear God, for the Bible and, and giving us uh, your written word so that we know what that example is. We ask you that you would just bless us and that you, would, that you through your Holy Spirit, would help us grow into that perfect man, dear Lord, and that, uh, that we would attain unto uh, what we can do, at least, dear Lord, something that would be pleasing unto you and in your eyes, where we would at some point be willing to, if it was, if it was uh, the situation arose where we would have to sacrifice ourselves for a brother and sister in Christ that we could do that. We love you. Just be with us. And in Jesus Christ's name, amen. Amen. amen.